There's something attractive about them, and I'm not talking about their looks. There's something that draws me to them. That's the way a light is that shines in darkness. 1 Peter 2.9, Peter says something similar. He says, ye are a chosen generation. Ye are a pecu- uh, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We're chosen, we're a priesthood, we're holy, a peculiar people. Peculiar means special, we're different, we're not the same as everyone else. If you're, if you're at work and, every, and no one knows that you're different, there's something wrong. If no one knows that you're a Christian and you're at work, there's, there's probably something wrong. We are a peculiar people. We're different from the people that are around us. Don't be embarrassed of what, of what you are. This world is so messed up. People are so messed up in their heads. We have something to be proud of. We, and, and I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about the grace that's been extended to us. We have something in us that, to be proud of. We have a great God. We are peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's important that we show forth the praises of God to the people around us, that we honor the one that has been gracious to us. The second thing that Dr. De Silva pointed out is that is that the, the client who had received from the patron was required, if he was, if he was a gracious person, was required to be loyal to the patron. Now, what's interesting is if you're reading, if you're reading some of the scholarly works nowadays, there's this reevaluation of, and I'm talking about, I'm not talking about apostolics, I'm talking about evangelicals, the ones that have been pushing this, this, easy, this easy grace. There's a reevaluation of what grace is. And there's also a reevaluation of what faith is. And, and they're starting to realize that faith involves more than just a mental assent, a belief. But it also involves obedience, it involves faithfulness. That, that when, we, when we live by faith, we're not, just, we're not just trusting God or we're not just believing in a mental, in a, in a, in a like accepting Jesus as our personal savior, but that there's more, that we, we need to live faithfully. That, that faithfulness is a part of, of having faith. The way we live actually matters. Now this won't be a surprise to anyone that reads their Bible because if you read the faith chapter in Hebrews, it's full of obedience, right? Noah had faith, and so what did he do? He built the ark. Abraham had faith, so what did he do? He was willing to sacrifice his son. There's always an action component with faith. There's always a faithfulness component with faith. So when we, when we have received grace from God, we need to have, be faithful to him. We need to have loyalty. We need to have allegiance to God. And the interesting thing is that in the Roman world, in the Greek and Roman world, is this was required even when things got tough, even when your patron fell on hard times. And so... The person that was, was gracious, that was a gracious recipient, they would be faithful even when times got tough, even when their patron w- was no longer at the top of the stack, but there was, they were going through hard times. In Mark 8, 34, Jesus says this, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Loyalty to God is not always going to be easy. There will be times guaranteed that you will have to take up your cross. Jesus said, why are you surprised, this is Jamie's rough translation, why are you surprised that the world hates you? It hates me. Why are we surprised when we are despised by those around us, when our Lord 
our master is despised by those around him. And so we need to be willing, as recipients of God's grace, to be loyal to him no matter what comes our way. 1 Peter 1.7 says this, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold, that perisheth, perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Peter says that, that the trial of our faith, that those things that we go through for the sake of Christ, for the sake of God, that they will be found to be praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And so we need to be willing to go through short-term dishonor so that we can honor God who has been so good to us. And finally, the last thing that the, grace, that the gracious recipient should do is look for opportunities to serve their master. Look for opportunities that they can serve the one who has been so good to them. And that's what we need to do as gracious recipients, is we need to look actively for times when we can serve the one who's been so good to us. We need to look for, not just, not just wait to be called upon, but we need to actively look for times that we can, we can, we can serve him, that we can do what's pleasing to God. What is the primary thing that God wants? His mission is to seek and to save those that are lost. Outreach is a primary thing that we do to be gracious towards God. Titus 2.11 says this, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Romans 2.4 says this. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness? Paul is speaking to people that, that preach one thing and they do, it, they do another thing. He says, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So God has given this kindness, this forbearance to us, and Paul's saying, do you presume on that? Do you, do you think that you can do whatever you want? That you, can, that you can accept the grace of God and still live the way that you want? Here's the thing is grace is freely given. It's given without coercion. It's, given, it's not earned. But once you accept it, there are certain obligations that we enter into with, with God. When we accept the grace of God, we enter into a relationship with God. And with any relationship, there's obligations. Did you know that, that when, you are, when you are repent and you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you are entering into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ? Jesus on the Passover, he said, this is my body. He broke the bread, said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup, he said, this is the... This is the blood of my new covenant. And so God, Jesus was establishing a covenant with the church. And so when we enter into, into uh, when we participate in the gospel of Jesus Christ through repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, infilling of the Holy Spirit, we are entering into a covenant relationship with him. And so we own, are no longer our own. We have been bought with a price. And so there are certain obligations that we are required to fulfill. When I entered into a covenant relationship with my wife, I didn't live the same way that I lived before I married her. I didn't talk to the same people that I talked to before. 
I made sure that if I was talking to female people, she was there with me. Female kind, I don't know, what's the, what's the proper? <laughs> When I, when I was talking to, to certain people, she was there. She had, she had a right to know what I was doing. I didn't just go and do whatever I wanted anymore. I told her, you know, I'm going here, I'm going there, and, and I'll be late. And She had a right to know what I was doing. She had a right to know what I was, who I was talking to. That's because I entered into a relationship with her. I entered into a covenant with her. It's the same way with God. When we, when we accept the salvation that he offers, we enter in, into a covenant with him. And there's certain obligations that we have. And so Paul's saying that you can't, you can't, uh, you can't presume on the kindness that God extends to us. But because of your hard and penitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And he will render to each one according to his works. Everyone likes to talk about grace, that grace covers everything. But Paul says that he will render to each one according to his works. To those by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does, not, who does evil, the Jew first, and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. God shows no partiality. So what's Paul saying? He's saying that, that God has extended his kindness towards us, but we can't presume on it. It's important that we take it seriously, that we recognize that this grace has been extended to us and that we can't just do whatever we want anymore, that we are being constrained, as, as uh, brother, uh, Dr. Wilson's book says, we are constrained by bonds of love. We have been constrained by bonds of love. So it's important that we are gracious recipients of God's grace. That we extend back to God what he has given to us. The danger of, of, of this teaching is that, and you can stand with me tonight, the danger of this teaching, and it is teaching tonight, is that it can lead to moralizing. And I purposefully chose scriptures that didn't give specifics, but talked about our attitude, or attitude towards God. But there's a danger that we can start to moralize, that, that we can build lists of what we have to do for God to be a gracious recipient. And I think probably that's not what God wants. He doesn't want us to be bound by rules and lists about what a, a proper response to him is. As the saying goes, there's ditches on both sides. And so that's, that's one ditch, is that, we, that we, we kind of build these rules and things that we have to do to be pleasing to God, to, to, to be gracious recipients of what he's given to us. The other thing is what Jude talks about, about, about those men that have come in and they've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. That that they presume on the grace of God, that, that they think that you can do whatever you want, that grace will cover it, that it doesn't matter what you do, the grace of God is, is, is big enough and powerful enough to, to cover it. That's true, but, but there is obligations that we have as recipients of God's grace. I think God want, wants us to live in relationship with him is, is that's that's the middle ground is that he's entering into a relationship a covenant with us he doesn't want us living any old way but he doesn't want us living by a list of rules either he wants to live inside of you he wants that's why he gave us his spirit so that 
that he can move and breathe in us and so that we can have relationship with him and so that as we get to know him we know what pleases him the same way that those of us that are married the longer that we live with our spouse the more that we know what they don't like and what they do like and so we try and be pleasing we try and do things that please our, our partner and that's the way it is with God there's a relationship there's a there's a there's a give and take with him and and so this is what I want to leave you with tonight is that we need we need to be gracious recipients of God's grace God has been so good to us we need to take seriously what he's done for us and we need to give back graciously to him for what he's done but I think I think in that journey in doing that I think you want to do it in the form of relationship where you're where you're talking to God you're saying God is this pleasing to you is what I'm doing now is that pleasing to you and God will speak to you he'll tell you what what's pleasing to him and what's not pleasing to him that's the beauty of having the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us let me leave you at Jeremiah 31, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Speaking of the new covenant, the outpouring of the Spirit on the church. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law on the inward parts and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. God, God has written, when he gave you the Holy Ghost, he wrote his law on your, your heart. And he took ownership of you. He said, I'm going to be their God. They're going to be my people. God wants relationship with you. A daily relationship with you. Once you start thinking about, you know, how much can I get by with and still be saved? You've gone, you've missed it. That's not what God wants. He doesn't want people that are just trying to get by with as little as possible and still be saved. He wants an intimate relationship with you. And really, that's what you want. That's what each and every one of us want, is relationship with God. That's what our desire is. I wonder if tonight we can just spend a few minutes, we can just talk to God and say, you know what, God? I want a relationship with you. If, if you feel like you've drifted away from that, that you don't have that intimacy with God anymore, I encourage you to reach out to him and say, God, I don't even know what to do, right? I don't even know how to to draw near to you, but I want to draw near to you, God. I want my life to be, to be a series of events drawing closer to you. I love you, Jesus. Let's just take a few moments tonight. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You are my God. I want to be close to you more than anything, God. I want to be pleasing to you more than anything, God. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. God, I don't care about the things of this world. I've already given up the things of this world, God. I want a relationship with you. I want to draw closer to you. I want you to, to speak to me daily and tell me what's pleasing to you. I want you to speak to me as I live my life. Show me what I, I should do to be pleasing to you. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I love you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. What a great God you are. What a great Savior you are. What a mighty Savior you are. You have delivered us. I thank you, Jesus. I give you the praise. I give you the honor and the glory tonight. I magnify your name, God. Oh, I want to spread your gospel among the nations. I want to extol your greatness to the people around me. I want people to look at me and see you. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
on, let's bless the Lord tonight. bottom of our hearts right now let's magnify the Lord thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you for your grace thank you for your mercy hallelujah hallelujah thank you brother Jamie McLeod for preaching tonight the word of the Lord amen as good as I've ever heard on grace amen thank God for the word of the Lord amen Amen. We have a busy weekend this weekend, and we want all of you to be a part of it. And uh, they're doing something throughout the weekend. We're having a outreach. There will be an outreach. Brother Jason and Sister Jesse are heading that up, and they'll be doing that. And it is a it is a very targeted and very specific uh, goal that we're trying to accomplish right there. And then they'll be coming back with the young people and spending the rest of the afternoon and evening uh, around, the, around the premise and playing games and whatnot. And then we want everybody to be involved with us on Father's Day. I want you to be here for 10 o'clock, bring a visitor and a guest. Amen. 10.30 church is going to start. Amen. We're going to have a wonderful time in God. We're going to have a wonderful touch of the Holy Ghost. And immediately following this service on Father's Day, we'll be doing a grill out and fathers will eat free. 
And so we want you to be a part of that. We want you to bring your lounge chair and we're going to play volleyball and just have a good time and just be together. And if you, if you know somebody that don't have somewhere to be on Father's Day, this is a great place to spend Father's Day. Amen? Amen. It's a great place. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach on Sunday morning through Brother uh, Roberto as an interpreter. And so I'm going to do that as a, just claim that and do that as an act of faith that we're going to have a lot of guests and visitors here. And we want the gospel to be preached, and we want the word of God to go forth. So do everything in your power to bring somebody in Jesus' name. God bless you tonight. We'll see you this weekend.